There is continuously dumb takes on YouTube, but I don't think we have a dumb take here, my friends. I get this question uh, literally multiple times a day. I get emails, I get whispers about it. So I wanted to watch this. And TJ was just like, you can watch it, go for it. I've been getting asked a lot lately about my thoughts about the future of software development. Whenever a new AI advance is released, I get a flood of questions asking, what is the future for software developers? And I think the question they are not asking is, will I still be allowed to code in the future? Obviously, everything besides C will still be legal. I He's correct. I don't know if you know this, but Gemini won't even show you C++ code. Unironically, that's not me exaggerating. That's not me saying some nonsense. C like literally, Gemini will not allow you to, to see C++ code if you're below 18 because it's, it's not. It's not safe for work. Literally, it's not safe for work. That's kind of funny. I didn't, I didn't realize how funny that was until I just said it out loud. I feel like the real question that they're asking is, will I still be able to get paid with the skills that I'm learning while I learn to code? Yeah, that's and reasonable. So the first thing I want to say is I hate predicting things, particularly in public. If you would have asked me five Fair. years ago about if any of this AI tech, if we would have it today, I'm pretty sure I would have said no. And I'm not talking about the crazy hyped up demos. I'm talking conversational AI that returns some semblance of a conversation, even if it's mostly hallucinated. I, I, I don't think I wasn't thinking that was going to be possible. So I've had to update my product. Good take right there, by the way. Public prediction, especially on tech, is just like, just the worst. It, 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 you're wrong 100% of the time. Hires many times throughout the last few years regarding AI and its capabilities, and therefore its future capabilities as well. So I just don't have enough hubris to think that I know what's going to happen in the future. Did we just get a hubris mentioned? Is TJ just dominating us with some, some Thomas Aquinas level speaking here? Maybe. I guess I do have just enough hubris, though, to post this video about my thoughts. <laughs> so there's two <laughs> major points, though, that I want to talk about. The first is that I think software is more than coding. And then the second is that programming itself is more than coding. And before I sort of go deep on those, I want to just seed for the sake of argument that AI will be able to do coding tasks that a junior engineer is currently exposed to do. AI will be able to perform these as faster, faster and more cheaply than those junior engineers. And AI will be able to do this and productionized, right, sort of rolled out to people um, sometime in, say, the next five years. I realize some people in my chat keep telling me that this is going to be in six months, but that rollout seems quite difficult to change the entire structure of an industry in that time. This is actually a super good take because what you might be missing, I don't actually even agree with TJ in five years. I think it's going to be a, a touch longer. Uh, a, I think the expensiveness of, of producing chips to be able to keep up with the demand is just going to be too high. And for a long time, it'll just be way too expensive to have a junior engineer that is AI, uh, is sp specifically with the amount of things it's going to continue to get wrong. I think we're still one generation away from things being at least moderately useful. You know, we, we had a we had a ban. So like, let's let's just calm it down. Flip, take this part out. You take it out. Flip. Who got banned? I don't even remember. That's how insignificant the situation was. Flip, you can pick it up right here. Okay, now now I remember. I remember where we're at. All right. I actually, I think the thing is, I actually think TJ is even off on that because just think about how slow the industry moves. Just like in, in, in all aspects, how slow things move. It takes a long time to do industry-wide changes, right? It takes a long time. So when people think like, oh, AI is going to replace all these jobs, it's like, yeah. You know, like you still have to like, I mean, think about how many checks and balances and new roles and discoveries and failures and all these things that have to happen before we even know how to integrate these things in well. It's going to take a long, long, long time. I, I, I don't foresee anything within this decade. We will probably have the time as a 32-bit 2036 problem before we have AI completely sweeping out all jobs. That's my public prediction. I go way, 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 way further. Is it 2038? 2038? 20, 2032? Uh, or 2036, 2038? It's somewhere in there. Anyways, 2030-something, we're going to have some issues. 
and from there we'll we'll, we'll work on it. January nineteenth, twenty thirty eight. Okay, maybe that's when the maybe that's how the AIs get integrated into these workflows is that they're able to solve <laughs> to solve all of our old crappy COBOL code and all the other codes, and now they can move right. So you just got to remember how slow these companies move. So that's just like something to just keep in your head. So even if AI, let's just pretend that AI today was good enough to replace a junior. How fast do you think that would happen? Like, real talk, I don't think you're going to see that happen even in five years if it could fully replace a junior like that. It would be so dang complicated because just think about the sheer chip generation that would be needed to even handle that workload. Let's just pretend it's it's 100%. Yeah, firing people isn't free. It costs money, it costs time. You have a whole management structure that's going to have to change. You have Git workflows that have to change. Like there is just a lot of things that you have to like think about that surround this. This is why when he says that, I mean, just the industry change alone, he's saying five years, I am adding a good 10 on top of that five, right? The reason I say that is because I don't want to fight about what I think the particular capabilities of AI are going to be. Instead, I want to talk about that yeah. with sort of that scenario in mind. And if you think any of those points are much too aggressive and your AI takes are so bad. Now you must explain yourself. What was bad about that take? Literally, what was bad about that take? Saying even if it's purely equal to a junior engineer, it's purely equal to a junior engineer. It's still going to take so long. The amount of like, dude, you cannot replace a million people and turn it into into like we don't even have the machine power for that. Like, what the hell are you even talking about? What's the bad part? You gotta hit me. You gotta hit me. B uh, union, hit me. B union, come on, come on. I will let them cook. Hey, please cook. Remember, your job isn't. Uh, by the way, for those that know, when I challenge you, I want I want you to t you can take two minutes and cook up a good response. Don't You don't need to cook fast, okay? We don't need a microwave meal. We want something good, okay? So if your response is like three words, and it's just like, I think it's bad, that's stupid, right? You, you idiot, la, 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 toy the old dick twist. I got him with the old dick twist. Well, that was anticlimactic. Uh, this is why we just stay neutral in this chat. Oh, you, know, you should not. You should not stay. You should. You should not stay neutral. If you have an opinion and you think I'm wrong, I don't mind. Like I actually like this part. I want you guys to know that I genuinely appreciate when people try to say I think this is bad. And that's why I bring you up on the big board because I want somebody that 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 has an alternative opinion to my mine. Your AI takes are so bad. Okay, he hasn't responded. He hasn't responded yet. Don't be an echo chamber. I, I, oh, you're genuinely, uh, you genuinely like singling people out for public shaming? How do you think this is public shaming? How exactly do you think this is public shaming? Now we got two people going, okay? We got two conversations going at the same time. I'm giving somebody the chance to say their piece. I'm giving, I'm giving the chance. Right? And we're even waiting. We're waiting. Classic hell. This is bullying. This is bully. Well, how is this bullying? Okay, now you guys are actually having L takes. Dude, is B Union not going to respond? Did, did B Union? Did B Union run away? Damn. I think I think we had B Union leave, man. I will say that if you're going to say something, you should be willing to you should be willing to back it up. You know what I mean? Lost a viewer. That's fine. If you're not willing, if you're not willing to put a little oomph behind what you're saying. I, th I think you're being weak, okay? That's soft energy. That's soft energy. That's like Microsoft uh, Microsoft VP of soft energy right there. Uh, I don't think AI will take over soon either, but I, I think your example is not a is bad in my opinion. Uh, companies mainly move slow if something does not give them a lot of profit. Companies are quick to lay off people, but it's so much more than that. Like, like I, I see what you're saying, but the problem is, is you have to think about all of the other shit that has to go into this. They have to set up contracts. They have to have guaranteed uptime. They have to have the ability to ensure that if anything goes down, even for an hour, how does it respond? How do production issues respond? How do, do you roll back? Do you roll forward? Who's monitoring the monitors? Who's actually doing all that shit 
that's involved. How many seniors can you have per AIs committing code? How long do you let the code sit? Do you trust the tests that are being written? Like it is a huge amount of like just testing and slow moving that's going to require a long, 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 long time before they actually go, okay, we're willing to hand this over because it saves us a million dollars a year, right? There's so much more than just simply, oh, it works. So therefore let's go. Right. There's 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 a lot to it. Like there are so much people you have to hire so much, so much process you have to set up. There's so much everything that has to happen. Right. Uh, all of these things need pr uh, pr uh, processes developed in order to work at enterprise scale. The enterprise scale is the only thing that could afford to adopt this right now. That's like the, there you go. This is beautiful, by the way. This is the crazy juxtaposition that we're kind of in, which is how do you like it's like building a program that requires users to submit information uh, to make it relevant, but you won't get users using it because it doesn't have relevant information. You know, it's like the old chicken and the egg thing, which is why like a lot of these, when you have the double, when you have the double relationship, it's really, really hard. All right, let's see if, let's see if B scale actually did it. B scale, I really wanted to see, uh, or B union, man, B union, I, I will say B union, that was a little weak. Okay. Damn. Little weak. Little weak. Weak mindset. I personally agree with you on AI. Uh, maybe not on Copilot 100%. That's fine. Weak take. That's a weak take. That's a common L right there. Say it with your chest, okay? You got something to say, say it with your chest, okay? I don't hate Copilot. I don't love Copilot. I don't hate Copilot. I don't think AI is terrible. I think AI can be very useful. But to think that the world is about to change to the point where companies are just going to be like, forget everybody, we'll run with AI. Just shows that either A, you're completely unknowledgeable about companies, B, you're completely unknowledgeable about the skill you're trying to say that you know, or C, you just are, you, you actually think AIs are magic. It's none of the three, right? I think you're overestimating AI and you're underestimating how s slow things move, right? In favor of AI, then that's totally fine. My argument will just be bolstered in my, <laughs> in my corner. The other clarification I want to make is that for the rest of the video, when I say coding, I'm sort of referring to this act of sitting in front of a computer, typing, autocompleting, copying, pasting a programming language into an editor, and then shipping that to prod. In some sense, yeah. the exclusively okay. physical act of creating software. So Good when definition. I say software, by the way, I love that TJ, whenever he makes arguments and stuff, this is again, why TJ is such a talented developer. And I think he's one of the best like coders out there is that notice that how he's creating this he's like setting up all the definitions and everything great job there is more than coding w what do i mean i'm saying people don't pay for code they definitely don't pay to just watch you code unless you're a twitch streamer i guess then people like doing that hell yeah but what they bro. pay for is for problems to be solved and when you're coding, you're not getting paid for that code. You're getting paid to solve somebody else's problems, real or perceived. These problems might be for a client or they could be for your boss or they could be even for other software developers, right? But the reason you're getting paid is because the problem you're solving for someone is valuable enough for them to part with their beloved cash. This boils down to software being able to maybe provide something that's faster or cheaper or more reliable than what could have been accomplished published previously. And software is a superset of just those coding tasks, of just literally typing into the computer, because you need more than just good algorithms or a nice type system to create value for your customers. Not to Was that OCaml? Did we just get OCaml mentioned? Did Teach just sneak in a little bit of OCaml right there? By the way, I agree with this entire take, which is that it just happens that the we all are just solving problems. It just happens that the way in which we solve it, the manifestation of it is by coding and coding is an exceptionally difficult skill to get good at. Therefore, if we could solve all of our problems with horses, we would just use horses instead. But that day and age of using donkeys and horses has left and now we have to use our mind. And so therefore, it just cost more because to be able to get somebody that could use a donkey somewhat well was a lot cheaper than someone who can communicate and take a problem from an abstract sense into a physical and exact meaning into a computer that works well with a bunch of people using it. Go horse mentality? Absolutely. That's why it's just gotten so, uh, that's, I mean, that's why it's so dang 
so dang valuable right now to know coding. By the way, every argument for AI amounted to it's gotten this far, this quickly, but that's the first 80%. Yeah, yeah, this one's very difficult on this one. I can't say whether you're right or wrong on this specific one, uh, meaning that is it going to go faster? Is it going to go far farther? Uh, but why male models? <laughs> but like, but real talk, like, is it going to be, is it going to continue to grow this fast? Maybe. It might even grow faster, but it might also grow way slower. So it's extremely, extremely difficult to know what the future is going to be for AI. That's why whenever I talk about AI, you'll, you'll typically see me say something along the lines of, I think next generation AI will be a lot more useful for these reasons. Because I'm not saying a time period. I'm saying a, uh, a, a step function, you know, like I'm saying the next iteration, right? That could happen in one year. That could happen in five years. That could happen in 20 years. We don't know when it's going to happen, but the next leap forward, whenever that next leap forward happens, I do think we will see a much different, um, enterprise response to how this is going to happen, right? I think there'll be a significantly different response. I think Devin will probably be a lot better. We won't all be saying, yo, fuck Devin. We'll be saying, why does Devin cost so much? You know, we might, we might change our tune a little bit when that time comes. You know, you know what I mean? And maybe, hey, we could also solve how exp exponentially expensive these things are, right? Like, I, I don't want to put bounds on what we can and can't do. But also, fuck Devin. Yo, fuck Devin, right? I don't want to put bounds on what, what can or cannot happen. It's kind of like a... It's dumb to think that because when I was younger, would I have thought that we would have our computers now where they are? are? No, I would have thought we would have been much faster. That's because I didn't understand technology. And I just thought, wow, we went from 1.3 gigahertz to 1.8 gigahertz in like, you know, only so many months. Man, here in like five years, I'm going to have like a five gigahertz processor. It's going to be awesome. In 10 years, it's going to be like a 20 gigahertz processor. But that's because I was incompetent to the scaling problems that exist. Right, I just didn't understand because I was young. I was a I was a young man not understanding anything. Say those aren't important. I just wanted to play Unreal Tournament. Important. Just I'm saying there is more to software than that. You need to be able to understand requirements and update them when things change. This may even involve. I hesitate to say it. Talking to a client or to a stakeholder. You Damn. need to be able to practice communication, understanding the non-technical aspects communicated to you sometimes called listening in the area of someone else's expertise. And you also need to be able to communicate technical concepts to non-technical people in your area of expertise. You need to be able to say no to feature creep and scope management. Your project can't do everything, right? You need to be able to say no to something you'd like to do, but think the cost is more than what it's worth. Like maybe rewriting your front end in Rust. By the way, there's so many things here that is actually really, really, really awesome. I should have paused it sooner, but I wanted him to get his idea out. Like one of the the one of the chief goodnesses of a good engineer is the ability to say no to improvements, features, things that come down the pipeline. And the reason why that is, is it can it can become an overall bad experience for people. And this would be like like imagine an AI future where you can just say what you want. You could imagine that every single product that we create gets obtusely complicated. Everything's FFmpeg because at some point you have every possible feature that some person thought about that doesn't even understand what the customer wants. And now you, you have literally just the most complicated everything, right? When we are not held back by time, it, it will be still very difficult. I think creating a good program will be very difficult, even if it was as simple as speaking what you wanted into existence. Infinitely configurable. Exactly. FFmpeg is a great argument against monoliths. <laughs> it is. It really is, because FFmpeg is obtusely confusing. GStreamer? Holy cow. You know what I mean? It's ho like, holy cow, it's difficult. To be honest, I am always rude to the non-technical sales who only shoot, uh, who only shoots to the moon. Any AI uh, won't do that because they'll report this AI is bad uh, and buy another AI that will always say yes to any of their needs. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's also, I mean, you should try not to be rude, but uh, always is also, you know, usually a bad argument for anything you do because I'm sure there's plenty of times that you're not actually rude. You know, I know you're a little exaggerating here, but again, saying no is a very important part of the process because... What you think the customer wants and what the customer wants are 
often very, very, very different things. And so to be able to constantly give them what they want is not good. There's an old saying, I think, about democracy. I forget how it goes, but it goes something along the lines is like democracy is uh, giving the people what they want and giving it to them hard. Right. It's like this. It's it's this funny Hell Divers 2 mentioned. That's actually even better with Hell Divers now around. Dude, we're giving them democracy hard, right? I forget who said this phrase. It's some funny phrase where it's just like, not only do the people get what they want, but they get it hard. Like, it's funny. Hell Divers 2 mentioned. Yeah, we need managed democracy immediately. There's social aspects to software and to making software. Like, listen. I do want to take one more thing that he said. Just imagine, like, for all those here, who here uses ChatGPT fairly regularly? Who here has been, who, who here is a prompter? okay? We, there's definitely some prompters in here. You can see a lot of prompters going on in here, okay? Maybe we don't need to know the exact number. Now, for all of these prompters in here, um, let's just say company comes by and says, man, we don't even need, <laughs> AI is just going to build it for us. We don't need none of y'all. Imagine how the prompting is going to go, right? It's extremely hard to even say what you want to say to get the thing created. And that's hard, like me talking to another engineer that's super good. Like that's already a challenge. <laughs> it's like, that is such a challenge just to get that right. And that's like me and one other person both paid to be here and both actually find each other good to work with and we want to be successful. And we're like, oh shit, I got that completely wrong. Why was I doing uh, what's it called? Red Rum. Uh, why was I doing that? Nobody knows. But you get the idea, like that's, it's already, so dang hard. So just imagine that it's like, again, this is why these things, this is why you get paid what you pay, get paid is because programming is so much more. It's really good to be good at your craft. And that's usually what I emphasize in this because I think a lot of people forego getting good at their craft for pursuing the soft side, which is not good either. Right? It's, it, 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 you don't want to forego one for the other listening to feedback and giving constructive feedback. There's mentoring and being mentored. There's patience, kindness, and respect. All of these things create teams that are generally seeming to be more effective at creating software. And there's also asking and understanding things like, how do we make money at this company? <laughs> the best software developers I've- Snapchat mentioned? Was that, a, was that Snapchat mentioned right there? Or uh, shall we say Discord? Discord. How do we make money? Ads. <laughs> Discord is like going to show ads, people. How do we make money at this company? <laughs> the best software developers I've ever worked at were great at all of these, including yep. coding. They definitely were great at writing code, but they understood each of these and helped me to learn to do each of them better. All of these skills will still be useful for as long as we have jobs. There are skills that you can practice and hone while working as a software developer or learning to be a software developer, regardless of your seniority and tech stack. I like that. But even beyond that, I want to say programming itself is more than just coding. And maybe this section should be titled something more along the lines of programming can be a superset of coding. And if I'm being very reductionist, and I, I want to be clear, very reductionist, I see sort of two categories of programmers. There's solution copiers and there's problem solvers. Solution copier is not exclusively about using copy-paste solutions. It's about using copy-paste solutions for copy-paste problems without examination. As a clarification, there are a lot of people who primarily sort of copy and paste code and solve a ridiculous amount of problems. They could be like a scrappy solo startup, right? And they are copy pasting because they don't have an engineer, uh, you know, a legion of engineers to write a bunch of code. They need to take the solutions that are available and ship quickly and iterate. Or maybe they're a non-programmer using Excel and copy pasted Python scripts to power some ridiculous real estate empire. I don't know. He's totally right about all this. This is, this is, it is a good breakdown because there's a lot of just like startups that are just like, they're just, you know, how many marketing pages are just copy pastas of another marketing page? They all look the same, right? They're all just like, uh, we got to get login. We're going to put in clerk. We need to host this somewhere, put it on for sell. Uh, we need to do this. We better use this. Uh, we better do that. We better, you know, like it, they're just all using the same technology. Right. And it's just like, 
just copy pasta to get the thing out as fast as possible. Let's go. No, the point is I'm not actually talking about that group of people here. Those people are still problem solvers. They're just focusing on a different set of problems yep. and a different set of solutions. Yeah, that's that's fair. I when I, whenever I when you know like I think of Rockstar Dan. If you guys don't know Dan, he's awesome. He, he used to do a whole bunch of startups here on Twitch. Uh, he's a pretty smart fella. Uh, and what I see with him and, and and a lot of people like that is that their focus is purely on a business, and coding is incidental, right? Coding is just like the the happy accident that has to that that exists to allow them to create the business, right? And so coding is like a cost center for them. They just simply have to get the thing out. And it doesn't matter about anything else. Coding is purely a means to an end. That's a good way to put it. Coding is a, a, a or a necessary evil. It's just like they just have, it's the only way they can to specify what they want. The solution copiers, they're not interested in how things work just getting passed to the next task. They're sort of unaware of the ways that different libraries and language and tools can solve their problems or might not solve their problems. They just copy paste the first solution from a Stack Overflow problem or now maybe their favorite LLM until CI is green. There's no concept of considering the context that they're that they're currently in. But this isn't just limited to technical problems like we've been talking about. It might be that they're not interested at all how their business works or how their makes money or what their customers want, right? It may be that they've never considered, does the structure of our own organization help us meet the goals and desires that we're setting out to do? In contrast, we have the problem solvers. These are curious people who try to solve problems via understanding. And I think these skills will remain useful even if we never write a single line of code again. And this is sort of where I think people are underestimating the skills that they can, once again, can learn via software development, right? And my point here. I'm going to quickly pause him here. There's this, uh, do you guys remember the article by Lane, by the way, boot.dev mentioned it. Uh, by the way, if you want to support a TJ, and I, at the exact same time, boot.dev slash by the way, become a backend dev, support TJ and I, exact same time. But Lane made this argument, which is like, I had this coding problem, and I had somebody try to solve it. And they effectively worked around the library, right? And by working around the library, it didn't, uh, it, it did solve the problem. But it wasn't actually the solve to the problem, right? You fixed the symptom, you didn't fix the underlying problem. And so instead, it, I believe it had to do with like a squeal C and some sort of null string, if I'm not mistaken. And he said, like, if only he would have went and looked at the documentation, gone through it, he would have realized that the problem isn't right here. It's actually how we defined the schema. And we should have just taken a bit of time and fixed the schema. Then we would have fixed this problem. And so like that's that's like a very important problem solving skill, which is to be able to take a step back and say, what is the root cause. And I, I absolutely love that. I absolutely love the root causing of things. Uh, this is a good thing. I think Tej is underestimating the number of software developers out there that do not want to learn anything. They want to make a buck, move into management, and be done with it. These low performers we all work with will contribute li uh, little or so little but fill uh, the jobs. Sure, they do fill the jobs. And these are also the first people out of the door when, as, as AI is integrated more deeply into enterprise. Okay, Because guess what also happens? Can anyone guess what also happens? Middle management also gets trimmed. As a lot of these jobs go, a lot of middle management also gets trimmed. And so these ineffective employees that become ineffective management become ineffectively jobless, <laughs> right? Like they, they, they go from one step to the next step to the next step. So middle management goes first in the next five years. Interesting take. No people, no managers. And so I, I don't like to consider that because I first off, I don't think we can qualify how big that group is. So I don't want to say that it's most engineers. I don't want to say that it's some engineers. I don't want to say it's the plurality of engineers. I don't want to say it's the minority of engineers because I have absolutely no idea how much of them there are. I've been in places where there's a lot of them. I've been in places where there's absolutely none of them. And so it's very, very difficult to know that number. And I, I, I most certainly don't want to emphasize that, but they do exist. But I, again, I think that people who just don't care will always be the first ones out, right? People who don't care will always be the first ones out. Here is that it, it's possible to not learn these and to not. All right, hold on. I'm just going to. 
There we go. Not practice these, even if you've been writing code for a long time. So for example, I think logical thinking is something that we can practice while we're doing software development. We can practice decomposing large problems into smaller ones. Uh, for those that didn't catch it, he was just saying stuff like, firing is hard, don't hire, dogs, fuck your company, shit ass interview. I, I, I don't really know what he's trying to say. Just not communicating well. <laughs> we don't need a bunch of noise, okay? We Hate can watcher. work we on no recognizing, iterating, and solving issues for customers that they're actually willing to pay for. You can get better at domain analysis, right? Understanding a problem set, possible solutions, and then how to implement some business logic or process to solve that. You can work on predicting edge cases or failure modes for those processes. You Here's a good story. Uh, when Netflix was started to do live, live service games, I went into some of the chats and I listened to, uh, hold on, this is some of the most banned streams. People have been weird today, you know? Uh, people have been weird. People just being weird today. You know, the thing is, I, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be real here for a second. One step to creating a good community is you have to be willing to lose a viewer. And when, when people are just like really explosive, and when people get really, really negative, it often makes everyone in chat feel a certain way. And when everybody starts feeling negative, you know what they don't want to do? They don't want to be in this area. And I've tried extremely hard to make this one of the most positive upbeat streams because that like that's what got me through all the shit in my life is being like just trying to continuously believe in the bright side of things and so that's why we do that i i, I do watch chat the reason why i watch chat is for these reasons is that i want to make sure that people like you know y'all 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 leave this stream feeling good right you feel like hell yeah i got i got a i got a purpose and i got a point to what i'm doing and i want to be able to keep on crushing ass like that's that's why we do what we do, people, okay? Um, I forgot exactly what I was gonna say here, so I'm gonna rewind it a couple moments. We can work on recognizing, iterating. Netflix, um, so when Netflix started doing the live service games, uh, I was I, I joined some of the chat rooms, because this was like a year and a half ago, cause, or two years ago, I was starting to get interested, and uh, and at that point, I, I built a lot of these super cool kind of test tools, I thought it was, built some drivers for some cool devices, blah, 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 cool stuff. Um, and then I just was watching everyone talking about like what's going on. And I saw that everybody was saying something without saying it, which is, hey, we're kind of flying blind on some of these things and it's very, very difficult. And so what did I do? Without telling anybody, without, without getting anyone's consent, without saying, hey, this is what we should do, I went, I'm going to start scraping this Mongo database, which contains a bunch of data points. I'm going to scrape some of these logs, these Kibana logs. I'm going to go through, and I'm going to just, I'm going to really just take apart a bunch of things. And what I'm going to do is you're going to give me your played game ID, and I'm going to come back and tell you, how was your frame rate? Did you drop frames? How was audio? Did you drop audio? What was going on? What was the server doing? How much load was the server on? How much things happened and then at the end of it was this a good game can i just give you a green check mark or a red x can i auto dock your experience if you say i had a bad experience i can say why this was a bad experience and then i showed my boss i'm like hey yo auto dock and he's just like do it and the thing about ai at least in this current generation I don't think AI can make that kind of leap, right? Is that I don't think AI can see a bunch of people saying, wow, like these things are really, I, we're really struggling here. Hey, we're really struggling over here. Hey, what was the frame rate of that last game ago? You know what we actually need? Let's take a step back and let's try to figure out, let's try to root cause the root of these problems and then give somebody something that can just give them a green check mark or give them, like, give them a thumbs up, thumbs down. Right? And that was kind of the goal. And honestly, that tool lasted for about four months, six months, and then we threw it away because better things came out. We got a team started up to build like this. They built it in React, bless their little hearts. Uh, they built like this nice little website, blah, 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 blah. And they did that, right? And that's what, the, that's what they did. And that was great. I didn't do that though. I just built the first one, which was a CLI to try to help get them, you know, to get us into a good, a good place. And like, that's the thing that people are missing a lot here. And this is what TJ is saying about problem solving, being able to take a step back. And instead of trying to solve the thing that is at hand, you go, why do we have these problems? In other words, not being reactive to the current situation but proactive to the next 10 situations that you can see. There's some intentionality, you know what I mean? There's some intentionality behind it of how to, uh, 
how to figure it out and solving issues for customers that they're actually willing to pay for. You can get better at domain analysis, right? Understanding a problem set, possible solutions, and then how to implement some business logic or process to solve that. You can work on predicting edge cases or failure modes for those processes. You learn how to do trade-off management and understand that there exists trade-offs <laughs> that you need to manage. Then there's pattern recognition, which is useful all around us. And so each of these skills seem to me at least like muscles that you can train and get better at. You can yep. use software development as a vehicle for doing that training. And all of these skills, by the way, very good. Again, uh, like the Netflix story, being able to identify the real problem and creating something that is really useful. And you got to remember that like that, that process is the exact same process as creating a successful company or creating an amazing game is to be able to see what the people want and be able to take that idea and turn it into something that meets those needs, those desires, those wants in a way that is both useful and enjoyable, right? It's like, it's a skill set and it's the same skill, whether you're building a CLI tool for three devs to be a little bit better or you're attempting to create a company. It's, it's really the entrepreneur mindset, right? If you want immediate money, make what the VCs want. If you want the big bucks, you make what the people want. You know what I mean? By the way, thanks for the hype train again, people. Okay, I know we're just a little lowly, just a little lowly, a little lowly stream here, but I appreciate that, okay? Hey, I appreciate the hype train are going to be useful once again for as long as we have jobs to do same with the soft skills that i mentioned in the software section uh, let me give you an example sort of illustrate this a tale of two neovimmers if you will and i know some people are already going to say using neovim that's just a waste of time that's okay that's fine if you don't like neovim that's fine but i want to give a parable sort of of two different people using neovim uh, it's not an exhaustive list just just two examples. So the first person tries out NeoVim because of some extrinsic reason, and they're hurried to get to step one of using NeoVim. They don't take time to read or understand or explore. Something breaks in their config, and they just post on Reddit until someone posts a reply with a solution. They might make an issue with no reproduction steps, and we've seen this kind of person in every dev community, and you can probably relate. In my opinion, this person actually is wasting their time with NeoVim, which by the way, is totally okay. We all like to waste our time in different ways. I like playing Stardew Valley with my wife and we waste time together and it's really nice. Pac-Man users wouldn't understand. However, that was an Arch Linux joke, by the way, for those that didn't catch it. He just dunked, just dunked on your, just dunked on your waifu pillow. I don't know. I don't know how many people out there right now are just, just in shambles over the, the Stardew Valley with wife, Pac-Man, Pokemane wife pillow situation that just went on there. Non-sex havers, I know. Tell me you're a sex haver without telling me you're a sex haver. By the way, Bastion, I, I did see it earlier. I, I, w w while, I'm, while I'm watching these videos and, and trying to stay on my, um, <laughs> no sex haver. No sex haver is definitely not a sex haver. Unless if that's like one of those ironic names, like Little John. Um, I have a girlfriend, okay? Uh, Anyways, hey, well, I genuinely appreciate it. I just want to let you know, I do recognize it. I do see it. I just, I, I typically don't interact with those kind of things while I'm trying to, because I'm trying to stay on track for the most part. And I'm already, I'm already really bad at staying on track. Okay. You've seen me. You've seen me in real life. I'm not good at this. Okay. I am not good at thoughts and, and success. I got ADHD. My girlfriend lives in Canada. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know of her. <laughs> Teach just doesn't know, Bisco. There isn't any learning going on through this neo -Vim experience. I love this. I, by the way, I love this. Which is bad if it characterizes every <clears throat> interaction that you have with skills that sort of are the culmination of your field. Compare this to someone who's enjoying using NeoVim. They learn to understand how to read documentation. They might learn a new programming language. They learn new idioms and APIs that can teach them about software design. When something breaks in their configuration, they learn how to read an error message. I know, controversial in 2024. They learn to debug software systems. They learn about rolling back, about lock files. They may even create a PR to fix a problem. They build solutions for themselves and are able to rapidly iterate on them towards something that solves a real world problem them for them they're their own by the way um i love building a solution for yourself i think a lot of people don't do that enough they constantly try to build a solution for everybody 
especially in this modern day and age of, oh, uh, you know, I got to get the best portfolio out. I got to make like a, a big splash open source project. I got to do something to be able to get, you know, you got to get all these things. But instead, it's just like, maybe you need to build something for yourself. My, honestly, my most successful open source project had nothing to do with anybody but how I envisioned navigating files. And that's simply because this was for me. It was only for me. It was never for anybody else. It was for me, by me. 5.4 thousand stars. That's pretty good, right? That's a, that's a decently sized thing. Wow, selfish. Exactly. It is selfish. Break it. Build it. Determine. TJ, O-Face. Dude, we got O-Face TJ. Oh, dude. Even TJ, when I pause him, gets good faces. What's that about? What is that about the fact that if you pause me, I'm like, you know, I just make it the dumbest. Dude, this man is, this man's making Mr. Beast thumbnails, even when I'm pausing. Own customer. This person has learned a lot, even if they end up with exactly the same code as person one. Both people spent a lot of time on Neovim. Uh, yeah. but, and the, but the first one, though, was a solution copier and the second a problem solver. The skills, attitudes, and perspectives characterizing the problem solver are helpful in many other domains. Even if AI takes over writing software for them forever and they never get to use a modal text editor again, which obviously would be very sad. Agreed. RIP mo modal text editors. Love modal text editors. They're very fantastic. In the examples I gave, you can replace NeoVim with whatever technology you want. React, Svelte, Rust, HMX, Excel, whatever. It doesn't matter. The pattern and the idea is the same. And my ultimate point here is that you get to choose how you're going to tackle problems and the takeaways you'll have from actually solving that problem. To move from copy paster to gigachad problem solver, as someone in my chat put it, largely revolves around you deciding to start thinking and asking questions today. And that's pretty much it. Then you make that same choice tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. And then you just keep doing that in a practical example, in practical terms of something you could try to do this with, just build something for yourself that solves a real problem that you have. It's okay if someone else has already built it. The point is that you're going to build it for yourself to see if you can solve this problem. Something difficult when making products for other people, particularly in you know large businesses or with a bunch of other people working on the project, is very hard to distinguish good feedback from loud feedback. It's common to have some loud feedback that seems to overwhelm and outweigh all of the other feedback that you are getting. Absolutely right. Again, paused it. Absolutely fantastic face. Again, totally normal looking person. Not sure how he does this. Uh, this man is not real. It is AI. This might be an, this might be Sora. Uh, but he's 100% right on this one. And this is, again, why making something for yourself. So I, I'm going to give you one little strategy that I personally like to do is that I will build something and I kind of do, as he puts it, the... Uh, I have something I want to build and I like hack my way through it. I find the first API that kind of works. I do this, I do that, and I just build it. And whenever I build it, it's ugly. I didn't like it. I didn't like a lot of the things I did. I didn't like the, the ways I handled it. I did that. And that, what it does is I go, okay, I have some things I need to investigate. What it does is first iteration for me is not even learning. First iteration for me is what do I need to learn? So by me building this real-time engine with, with, uh, with, with Go and NeoVim, something that I realized I really need to understand with Go, because I didn't really know what to learn with Go, right? The syntax is super easy. But what do I need to learn to be effective with Go? Well, I learned that I just using channels isn't the right way. I need a little bit more. I need to be able to add in some context. I need to be able to kind of like, how do you structure a program such that when a user, say, closes their TCP connection or the server wants to close the TCP connection, like it has a nice uniform way, clear, make sure all the memory is cleared out. There's no dangling anything. There's no running go funks that are just forever stopped on some sort of select statement. Like, how do I use this and how do I build something in a more holistic way that is actually useful. And I would have never come to that conclusion as the thing that I need to learn about Go unless if I would have first built something and just hacked my way through it. And so it's like one of these things is that even knowing what to learn is such a hard, hard thing to do.
And so by building something yourself, you will learn where you're bad and what you don't understand. Or you will learn what you don't – like why does, this, why does this part feel difficult? I need to research why this feels difficult because with my current understanding and tool set, I can't solve the problem in a way that feels uh, like scalable. So thank you, by the way, for that hype train. Genuinely appreciate it. And you'll have fun doing it. That's the best part. When you build something for yourself, it's fun, right? You got no stakeholders demanding time. It's just you building something that's actually making your life better. You're like, I have this problem. I'm going to solve this problem. This problem will make me more effective. It will give me something I like. I will be able to have more something if I just solve this thing. Boom. You're motivated. You're happy. You're intrinsically motivated, which by the way, intrinsic motivation is always going to be your strongest source to finish things. If you are extrinsically motivated, you will often find yourself going in and out of hype cycles, right? Because when you're extrinsically motivated and you have to do something boring, you're like, uh, and you're going to sludge through it and it's just just so awful. But when you're intrinsically motivated, that's just one necessary step to the end. And you're like, oh yeah, now I got to do this part. Here we go. Like I have to refactor some of my Go code. Do you think I'm excited about refactoring? I largely don't love refactoring. I find refactoring to be a lot of kind of pain in the ass. It just means I didn't make good decisions to begin with. It means I have to go learn a new effective way to do stuff. And But I'm so motivated to do that because I want to finish my little engine. So now I actually like this refactor, because this refactor's purpose is to learn how to use context and channels effectively and then apply it to a problem I already understand. Beautiful. For real, I love refactoring. The refactoring for the point of just simply taking a problem and changing it into a new way, I often don't like because it just means, typically what it means is that I, I, I just simply messed up and now I need to take a moment to try to make a better API. And I often, what, what that usually means to me is that I'm gonna do this exact same operation again here in two months. I'm gonna do that exact same operation again here in two months. Because whenever you refactor, what you're saying is I don't understand this problem well enough to create a solution that's gonna hold or things change. And so for me, it's just like, damn, I'm gonna ha I know I'm gonna do it again. So I'm gonna meet, I'm gonna meet this goal right here. I'm gonna try to refactor it into something that's gonna be useful for longer. And then I find that I can go longer. I can enjoy the API I've set up, but eventually some new requirement comes in that defeats my previous refactor. And so then I have to rethink about where are things at. I'm not sure I've ever written something uh, that was correct the first time. I've done a couple corrects. I've done a couple corrects, but they're always very limited. The more limited your scope, the more simple your, uh, your, your correctness is, right? Well, he, uh, tiny corrects. Yeah, t sm small corrects. Like one time I was building a program with uh, someone in 2016. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was an arbitrage bot for cryptocurrencies, and we did it in Node.js. Bless my heart. Hey, just let it happen, okay? Just let it happen. And one small thing I built back then, this is when prom uh, await and async await was just kind of coming out, is that I did a little wait function, right? And so you just handed it some milliseconds, and it handed you back out a promise that would resolve. Great little API. There's never a needed item again from it. It was absolutely fantastic. And so I was very happy about that. That's an example of just building something, just some small abstraction correct once. But it's such a tiny problem that almost everybody would have got that correct. Once you expand that, it just gets progressively more and more difficult. I've written that six times already. I, dude, I, I actually had that function on a NeoVim hotkey, which is space WW. And it would actually just write function or async or a function a uh, wait number number return promise void <laughs> just it's just write the whole thing oh man it was funny so the nice thing about building something for yourself by yourself was the bot successful yes the bot was very successful but uh the problem is is that i just needed more cash to be able to do a proper arbitrage bot especially when you're doing cross exchanges so we did cross exchanges we did a we did uh we did a, a, a min max flow, a max flow algorithm across graphs, being able to do like a min cut and be able to do this kind of like, hey, you want to change through five different currencies across three different exchanges and you will make how much money? The big problem came down to, of course, being able to transfer stuff out of exchanges and B, just having enough money. For that to actually work, I needed millions of dollars. Uh, we made, I think one day we made like $5,000. It was awesome. 
But then as things got t- – like once you started making money, unless if you had like a good relationship with these, with these places, I couldn't transfer out more than like $1,000. And so then it's just like you're stuck. And so you're just – unless if you have tons of money, you can't, right? Uh, were you arbitraging internationally? Uh, I was doing it across Kraken, Bitfinex, 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 Bit, Bit, Bit something, Binance, Coinbase. So, you know, we had four different things. I, it, dude, I, I made zero dollars in the end, okay? Okay, you know, I uh, – BitConnect, BitConnect, Bit, Bit, Bitfinex, Bitfinex, Bit these nuts. I can't remember. Anyways, at the end of the day, I made no money with uh, with cryptocurrency. Okay, I some the the easy. If you were in 2016, the proper thing was just to hodl. Okay, I didn't hodl. I thought I could be smarter than the market. And typically, whenever you think you're smarter than the the market, you always lose. Okay, I'm a loser. I learned a very valuable lesson, which is never be smarter than the market. Bisco, I'm not even I'm not even playing that video. Self is. You get to be that loud and obnoxious user. And then eventually, you'll get to decide if you've solved your problem or not. And if you didn't, that's okay. You iterate. As I tell my three-year-old son, it's okay to fail. That's part of how we learn. The important part is that we use our roughness and our toughness to try again. And you can translate that to any age-appropriate way (laughs) of saying that for you. I love that. We read that article yesterday where I, uh, Julia talked about how uh, she was scared and all these different reasons with software development and how fear uh, makes bad software and all that kind of stuff. And it fundamentally comes down to a lot of people are afraid of failure. And like unless if you have it ingrained in your body that failure is natural and failure really is the only way to learn, then you're going to be forever stuck in this permanent – this, you're going to be forever stuck in imposter syndrome, right? It's true. It's, it, you just, I, 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 it sucks. It's a, it's, it's a, it's an, it's an unfortunate product of our society. You know what I mean? And we can blame it on this, that, and the other, right? Some people had childhoods where they grew up and they got overpunished, right? And so therefore they're like, well, you know, I got overpunished. Like, but you know those things, right? Why is it stopping you now? The thing is, is once you know, you got to try to make corrections at all points, you know, and if you are afraid to do something, to be brave is to, to, to not be not afraid. It's to do something while afraid, right? There's a difference between the two. In conclusion, what I want to make clear though, is that I'm not saying solution copiers are bad people or that I don't like them. Instead, I'm trying to communicate that I would be a bit more concerned if all the skills that I've developed revolved around regurgitating existing solutions. That to me seems an area that is more likely to be automated by AI in some fashion and more quickly than other areas of software development. Agreed. Agreed. That's because there's, there's the, the answers are a bit clearer. Like, Getting a website that has three boxes, that has different price points, and a login with Clerk, and hosted on Vercel, like, you're not really doing anything, right? At some point, an AI will do that. It just will. Now, right now, even, maybe even Devin could do that right now. And that's because it's not doing something that is in itself impressive. I don't like giving advice on the internet, mostly because life is much too complicated for someone to explain their situation to me. And then it's much too complicated for me to explain my advice to them through this medium. Again, how many times have we seen in chat where someone's like, hey, should I learn X or Y? Hey, this happened at my job. What should I do? And it's just like, yo, this is a bad place to get. This is a bad place to try to get advice because I don't know your situation. I don't know you. I don't know who you're talking about. And is my life experience good to give you advice on this one, right? I ugh. Should I ditch Arch and try to find a wife? Yes. So I, I generally don't give advice, but sort of despite this, advice for me like be curious, pay attention, work hard, don't be afraid to fail. Those have never really led me astray. Thinking this way, Once again, in my opinion, right, give someone the best chance at success, regardless of how quickly and thoroughly AI expands into other software fields. I don't know what the future is going to look like. I'm just a regular mortal. I put my pants on two legs at a time. But I do think even discounting. 
Did TJ just admit that he sits down while he puts his pants on? TJ sits and puts his pants on on the floor. He probably is like up in the air, just just putting his pants on. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Pants put on sitter. Yeah, dude, pants put on. Dude, he's... Doesn't make any sense here. I mean, all the arguments I made throughout the video, right? That if your current hypothesis is that billions of new lines of code are going to be generated, it seems likely that truly understanding some things about code now not everything not every language not every framework not every type system but just some things about software itself that seems to me to be a beneficial skill compared to many other possible skills you might have or might want to learn yeah particularly if you like learning about it and you want to get really good at it i hope that this can be encouraging to you to both learn and work hard in your software endeavors and also some confidence that maybe even if we never get to write code again that a lot of what we're learning can be really useful and transferred to other domains let me know what you think let me know if you like the video thanks everybody i love you see you later it's a w it's a w by the way you should like tj uh for those that don't know uh, what a weirdo uh if you don't know who tj uh, tj is right here here i'll just give him a proper shout out uh tj dv there you go. There's a proper shout out with TJ. Uh, generally, I, I find that I, I almost ex exclusively agree with TJ. TJ is one of the few people that I would definitely echo chamber with hard. Um, very good guy. Please uh, keep your pants on, Prime. I'm trying to keep my pants on, okay? But it just feels so good to take them off. Uh, go like this video. Apparently, I can't copy pasta. All right, go like the video. Go give him a go give him a, a, a sub on the YouTubes. Absolutely fantastic. Um, someone just said in the chat that, hey, I left for an hour and came back and he's still on the same video. Yo, dog, this was a 15-minute video. You think that... You think that I'm taking less than an hour to watch it? Come on, man. There was a lot of sauce in there. We had to think about things. I wanted to, we, we wanted to talk about it, right? You got to talk about it. You got to think, like, the real talk, if you're watching videos by yourself, you should pause them for a second and think about what is being said. You know what I mean? You should take a moment to think about that because it is such a, it's, 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 it, there's so much dense information, even in simple statements and taking a moment to like argue with yourself why it's true and why it's false is really good. What's the longest video I watched on stream? Oh man, I did like a 20 some minute video. And it literally was like an hour and forty minute outcome. It's why it's why I typically it's why I typically don't watch longer videos on stream, just because it it, it takes entirely too long for me to get through them. You know what I mean? It, you know, another piece of advice that I actually thought was really good. I think this one was this was given to me by Alex Hermosi, which thus which which in turn got it from somebody else. Well, actually, it was given to me by my wife, who was who received it from Alex Hermosi, who received it from somebody else. But what I got was. Uh, it's not about how many books you read. It's about how many good books you read. And when you find a good book, read it multiple times. And so I find that I, I like when I find a good book, I will read a section multiple times. There's one book that I've read a section. I mean, I, I've done many books where I've, I, I reread something over and over and over again because I want to understand the point. Like uh, one thing I've really struggled with understanding is there's a there's one of the great poets, one of the great English poets. Uh, his name was Coolridge. He was considered one of the last men to know any to to, to know everything. He had uh, he had a degree in physic. He had a degree in uh, uh, he he just like knew everything. He's one of the last last men to know everything. And that was a and he wrote poetry. He wrote like a uh, rhyme of the ancient mariner, right? And so. Trying to understand his philosophy on God and life is extremely difficult because he never quite wrote it down, and he had a lot of rambling thoughts on it. So it's like it took a a a physic physic uh, uh, back then it's called physic it's called physic right which isn't physics it's like that was like medicine right um, uh, what's his name Benjamin Rush also another physic guy right. Um, founding father, America, for those that don't know. Benjamin Rush, very interesting story. I've gone through half of his biography. But anyways, uh, 
like going over and over again through someone's argument is really, really difficult, you know, because you really want to understand it. Like you do, you do the same thing with like data structures, right? To understand data structures, you can't just simply watch a video once. Like a really good example is what I want you to do is I want you to go on YouTube and I want you to watch how B-tree uh, deletions work. And every single video you will watch on how B-tree deletions work completely skip a very important step. All of them. I, I watched every last one of them. And all of them skip a very important step. And so it was very, very interesting to watch how it was going. How do you delete something when you have multiple intermediate nodes in between, right? And so like, how do you re-merge up a tree? They never mention the fact that you need to re-merge up a tree and all that. And so just like watch it, think about it, and then how do you do that? You have to take all the things they've said and reapply it into this one situation. And so it's like, I think this is a lot what TJ is saying in this video, which is it's not about the simple act of completing it, right? It's not about, oh, I read 10 books this year. No, it's like, did you understand one book well? Does that make sense? I'd rather understand one book well than have read 10 books. Yeah. Good times. Hey, the name. Weird tangent at the end there. That was a very bizarre, ta a very, very, very bizarre tangent at the very end. Someone said Chesterton mentioned. I've actually never read anything from Chesterton. I've only read a couple of his little little things. Uh, but I would. I, I, there, there will be a day. There will be a day. We'll see. A Jed.